Thanks for tuning in. I'm Craig Lieberman, and I've been tinkering on cars since 1980. I've owned more than 40 cars in my life. Some were heroes, some were zeros. But never in my wildest dreams would I ever guess that three of my cars would go on to star in a motion picture franchise. My Supra, my GTR, and my Maxima all had starring roles in Universal's Fast and Furious movies. Over the next three years, I'd served Universal as a technical advisor. I helped choose the cars, procure the parts, oversee their build, and support both production and post-production. I've got some great stories to tell, and that's why I created this channel. I hope you like the video. Breaking news, everybody. Breaking, breaking news. Here we go. You're not going to believe it, but it's real. Multiple sources are now confirming that Universal's favorite cash cow, the Fast and Furious franchise, is boldly going where no street racing movie has ever gone, into outer space. <laughs> yep, they're really doing it. It's for real. This isn't an April Fool joke. This isn't a clickbait video, and it's not a figure of speech. Read my lips. They are actually going into space. <laughs> Here we go. Chris Bridges, a.k.a. Ludacris, hinted in an interview in July 2020 about the fact that the franchise has just about gone everywhere, so why not into space? That was kind of a slip, or was it kind of a hint? Turned out it was a hint. In an interview on the Sirius XM program, The Jess Cagle Show, this week, series star Michelle Rodriguez, who of course plays the formerly dead Letty, fessed up about when asked about the rumor. Basically, she said this. As we boomers like to say, the series has jumped the shark now. For you younger fans, the phrase jumping the shark refers to the 1970s TV show called Happy Days. In the, in the Happy Days TV series, one of the main characters was a guy by the name of Arthur Fonzarelli, who played like this 1950s style motorcycle gang member. And he decides to jump over a live shark on water skis. After that episode, the series went downhill. And so today, when you hear somebody say it has jumped a shark, that really means that something has changed permanently and not for the better. So it's not a compliment. One could also argue, though, that the Fast and Furious series jumped the shark long ago. Some say the series died with Paul, but box office ticket sales don't show this to be true, really. Fast 7 made $1.5 billion, and Fast 8 made $1.2 billion. So it's doing pretty well. But maybe that's a hint that the series is running out of gas. Maybe a dose of rocket fuel will launch the series to new highs. Who knows, but they're taking the risk anyway. So how will they incorporate a space adventure into this movie or in the franchise? Really, it's anyone's guess. Maybe they're trying to steal Elon Musk's tes Tesla that was launched into space years ago. Maybe Jesse is being held hostage on the space station by Russians. Or maybe getting launched into space was the result of too much NOS. I can't even imagine what was going through their heads. The movie trailer we saw last year showed some kind of stealth plane, though. If I were a betting man, I'd wager that the space adventure will be a tiny sequence in the film and will probably have something to do with that stealth plane. Just an educated guess. Or maybe a malfunction of the rocket power Fiero will accidentally propel them into the Milky Way. Why not? <laughs> Anything can happen. Look, I get that these movies are no longer made for car fans only. They're made for teens and preteens. And if I were 10 years old, I'd get a stiffy every time I walked into a new Fast and Furious movie. But the novelty wears out as puberty sets in, or at least I like to think so. <laughs> I mean, I remember in my own, my own teens, I remember watching James Bond movies in the 1970s. And even as a young lad, some of the physics were sketch. Even to someone who, like me, who couldn't get a paper airplane to fly, I still knew that something was going on with the physics. And by the time the Moonraker movie hit the theaters in the 1980s, I was done, man. It was just so absurd at that point, I couldn't go on. And so I kind of outgrew the movies. But here we are 20 years later in this franchise. I have to wonder what goes on in the production meetings with Vin Diesel and Universal executives. Maybe they're coming up with script ideas after a night of drinking. How many times have you been out drinking with your friends and just kind of spitballing ideas? I don't know, man. You know, it'd be really cool. It'd be really freaking cool if they just if they just like went in, went they do they they went into space and stuff. Yeah, they could be flying around and just and then just of course the cars. You know, we got too many rocket engines. I don't know. And, and Tyrese be able to go and bruh, 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 bruh. I don't know. I, just don't know. I just would love to be a fly on the wall in those production meetings, just one time. At this point, though, the franchise can seemingly do no wrong amongst its fans. No matter how outlandish the plots, no matter 
how over the top the stunts have become. No matter who dies and who gets resurrected, fans seem to still flock to the theaters to catch the latest Fast and Furious movie. That's a good thing. For some audiences, we've been clinging to the hope that the latest movie will surprise us with a return to the series street racing origins. Nope, turn down, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nope, no street racing. For others, any movie after Tokyo Drift is like watching a dumpster fire, something like keeping up with the Kardashians. We just want to see how absurd it's going to be and what's going to go down. I get that too. But for people like me, it's a secret guilty pleasure. I still see all of the movies at least once. Why? Lots of reasons. I like seeing the cast go to far off exotic lands, drive wild, exotic, rare, and collectible, collectible and expensive cars, line up, and then watching them all get launched off of a cliff, out of a skyscraper, or just crash and explode while the actors walk away from the wreckage as if their parents are paying for their car insurance premiums. <laughs> It's, it's just hysterical. I love it. It's, it's not supposed to be a documentary after all. So go to the theater, ignore the unrealistic stunts, the silly plots that have more holes in them than a block of Swiss cheese, and just enjoy the fact that we can watch expensive cars get blown up. All I know is that the movies remind me of my love of cars, no matter what kind of car, and the people I've met from all around the world because of my tiny role in the first movie. So these movies are still special to me, even though they've gone down that certain path. And frankly, all of the focus on the family in the movie sort of rings true, doesn't it? It doesn't matter where the characters go and what ridiculous adventures they endure. Walking into that theater for each installment is like going home for Thanksgiving dinner. It's just good to see the family together again. And there's a lot of that. Maybe it's nostalgia as I get older, but that's what it is to me. So give your prefrontal cortex the day off, suspend your disbelief, and walk into the theater with your head held high and an open mind and a sense of humor. After all, Star Wars isn't real either. Surprisingly, Fast 9 will likely not be the last movie, if you can believe that. They're supposed to end with the 10th installment. But with Fast Now going into space, where could Fast 10 possibly take audiences next? Who knows? I feel like Fast 10 should really be tied to a Back to the Future sequel so that Doc and Marty can go back to 2001 with the cast and tell them to stop making Fast and Furious movies after Tokyo Drift. That's my Christmas wish. I hope they can make it come true.